going to bed. That's much better than I thought you would. <laughs> and I heard 2 a.m., but I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a minute. Too early. Too early. Okay, well, uh, we're all ready to jump back in, right? So I'm hopeful you had a chance to look at the terms and conditions for Logo Tournament. Um, and as we said yesterday, our job is as the lawyer today. Our client has come to us and said, I need a logo. I found this site. I'd like to get my logo through this site. I have some kind of contract. Would you please take a look at it and let me know your thoughts? So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Count the pages and give the price. He have to read. But besides that, personally, as much as I could understand from that agreement and read it, I wouldn't recommend him to choose that side. Okay. Because uh, even though since uh, he is the low cost, in fact, if you read the agreement, yeah. There are no too many securities about this kind of relationship, let's say, between the client and the site. Because the company didn't undertook too many, how to say, didn't undertook anything. Logo but, tournament. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, they wanted to be harmless of everything, of everything that could happen uh, during this process. So, regarding securities, there were not enough. Bless you, please. Even in uh, regard of quality or rights of uh, creation or... Okay. So, I recommend him better to have a private agreement with somebody that is working only for him yeah. and that things were more clear in there. Okay, fair enough. What would be expected. All right. Who else has thoughts? So your primary point is logo tournament disclaims all responsibility. Yes. Okay. Uh, and you're, you had said uh, as much as you could understand. Is that because you felt it was poorly written or just like a language barrier thing? No, I, personally I need more time to read it more carefully and more. Yeah. Okay. So I just read it like that. We're too many pages, in fact. Yeah, it's yeah. a really word. Right. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's okay. not just for lessons issues. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Other thoughts. Uh, two issues. I saw them. Okay. You were the only one, so. <laughs> uh, first of all, it was the the right to display the content of the uh, the content of the design without permission, so the, tour, the local tournament had the right to display it in another website without mm -hmm. permission of the designer. And the other one was that they could uh, use this uh, content also when the contract is terminated. Also, also <coughs> the, so the cooperation between the user and the local tournament is terminated. Yeah. So they can use it uh, in their site, in their other website. Right, okay. So beyond this, so without the uh, permit. So they had the, uh, let's say, unlimited right, copyright on the design, uh, on the content of the design. Okay. So this was two things, I guess. So okay. from, them, from them doing their homework, I understand that they offer no guarantee as to the IP. Send you an email or a no, notification. No. Oh. All right. 
But the other thing was that there is no guarantee of the copyright. I mean, they say you sh you should, it must be original, but in the end, if it isn't, then then what? Like, there was no solution to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's risky. Right, okay. Um, you said the other classes. Was there a class called like online contracting? Yeah, yeah. 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 And you've had that class? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the first one. Okay. Last, 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 last. Okay. What about you? you? No. Oh, okay. You had something else? Yeah. They are service provider. Yeah. So they clearly said that they don't protect anything. It is your responsibility. Uh -huh. So if you find that it is infringing in, 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 as a logo or as a trademark, they will remove it. I mean, if from the other side, if you have a commentary for that. Contest. The, the, they could close the page anytime. <coughs> so it doesn't matter if you were in the middle of process. Right. Without notification, without giving a reason. Okay. Any other thoughts about it? What about, so all the comments so far I think were with respect to the contract, to the extent to which there is a contract, between Logo Tournament and me. And the and the user. What about even for with the, the designers? designers? There were too, too much regulations, such as uh, <laughs> I don't really can remember one by one. But uh, I read it, but I saw that was at least I said too many pages to read. For the designer, where this two point that I mentioned that uh, they had the right to use the content of the to display the content of the designer in other websites without permission. Regardless of whether it was the chosen design, right? So yeah. designers would submit as many as they want, but as I mentioned yesterday, I got 10 or 20 from each designer, so all those could be used by Logo Tournament, correct? Yeah, okay. so it was and the second one is that they can use it also after the termination of the agreement with the designer. Yeah. So if you agreement terminated with design, they can use their uh, designs. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Well, I think it was only usage to display, to show to customers what they have done, not just yeah. to use it as a commercial purpose, but yeah. just as a, an example what they did. And also, right. I think it was the designer uh, could have used the logo just in his portfolio, not for commercial usage, and only after he notified the customer Right. So that's at least what I got from regarding disputes. Uh, they, they have this uh, provision that if you have a dispute with another user, you know, you, you will release us, we're not liable. So they were like, you, you have no protection let's say, with, uh, with another user of the site or with, I don't know, regarding the logo or something like that. And they refer to the US <coughs> California uh, pro commercial code. And about the jurisdiction, there was uh, at the last part, uh, this contract was under the jurisdiction of British Columbia, yeah. which is something that is not uh, um, in portion with the, the California Civil Code, or is going to be under the US uh, jurisdiction, or is going to be under the Canada right. jurisdiction. Right. So that's important to me. Let's start with that one. I've been taking notes, and we'll talk about a lot of interesting points in this contract. So. The jurisdiction one is a good one to start with because only one law, only one set of laws about intellectual property can apply, right? So in this case, we're, t we're talking about a copyright to start with. It's a, it will be a copyright protected work of authorship that is intended to then become a trademark. So right at the outset, it's copyright law. Which jurisdiction's copyright law applies? The contract says British Columbia, so yeah. that would be Canadian. Canadian. Is that what applies? The jurisdiction of the state where the contract is uh, concluded. That's the law that governs between the parties. 
So in this case, yeah, but the party's here, so I'm in Athens. Yeah. Logo tournament is in we Canada. Have some meetings about this, so this, where is the central offices of this party? And that's uh, me. Of which party? Because unless unless we're extremely lucky, there. Between the designer in this, in this case. And so the, the, the logo that governs the, the contract is the logo where the designer has the central premises. And the client must be agree, must agree with this. And why do you say that? What, the, so, and let's assume the designer is a person. But why the designer? Why why would because it be where he has the responsibilities about this uh, process? The client doesn't have so much information about how this uh, product will be developed. The client is uh, oriented by the designer, and in uh, in one manner, the client <coughs> has to agree has so much that he can uh, understand all this. And that's the reason, I think, why the role that government governs this uh, kind of services is uh, imposed by the okay. designer and the central office is where the designer has the services. Okay. Or the designer is uh, organized or has the entity. Yeah. Well, let's assume the di designer is a person, so where they reside, right? It's, a, it's not an entity, it's a person. It's an actual person. But he has a level of uh, identification. So he has... Um, but he's from so another country, from Germany. He's from Germany. We don't know where he is, which is a good point, right? But let's say he's from Germany. Yeah, German yeah, so the German has uh, uh, must learn uh, this kind of... I'm not sure if I got this part right, but what I understood was that between the customer and the designer, you could find you could choose some dispute resolution, and you could uh, in in with the British Columbia law, it was only if you had with the company with the logo tournament. At least that's what I got. And between the designer and the customer, you had I mean some kind of type of time to choose the dispute, and if you didn't choose the dispute, I guess. The local tournament did something. I'm not sure if I got this part right. And they have this dispute resolution mechanism, but I don't think that, uh, that I don't think that specifies what law applies. No, so it didn't. It yeah. was maybe to choose between the parties. Yeah. Maybe just that this provision to pro not protect themselves, just to say that okay, that's not our problem. Yeah, well, I think the the underlying theme for logo tournament is not my problem, right? And I don't, I don't really think that's necessarily unreasonable because I look at Logo Tournament as a broker, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to buy a house, I'll use a broker. And I have a transaction with the seller, and I'm the buyer, and the broker's in the middle, and the broker pretty much says... Yeah. But when you read it, it's my parents? Says it was... It yeah, yeah. It's it's you read it every time. It, it was not one time. It was every time written the same things. So yeah, I mean, I find that to be poor lawyering because you don't, you don't need to say it that many times. It's a wasted paper, inefficiency, and you don't need to say it 20 times in 20 different ways, right? Just say it once. Say it in right. Paragraph. Say it right. <laughs> yeah, and then move on. Right. But let's return to this idea of the governing law. So I think you're, it's a reasonable position you're taking. Does anybody else have thoughts on what law governs? The contract says British Columbia, maybe only as between local tournament and purchaser. You think it is where, uh, where the designer is because they're the one that has the obligations, correct? But, well, uh, do we know where is local tournament registered? We don't, but I'm assuming British Columbia. <laughs> Why would they put that if they weren't yeah. there? Huh? Since you don't know nothing, you got no guarantee. They might put it there just for putting it. I mean, right. Because, as I said, it might be a person working from home somewhere in Tirana, in Skopje. I don't know. Yeah. But oh, somewhere in the website they said we are a Canadian company. 
you know, the owner of a piece of art from destroying it because its existence promotes the useful arts. But in the United States, Congress has said no because of the capitalist system. I pay for it, I do what I want with it, right? But if I were advising a client, I would say, well, we need to figure out where this designer is. And by the way, if they're anywhere other than the United States, they're gonna have these lingering rights to your trademark. And if your, tra if your trademark becomes the next Nike swoosh, they'll always have that right. Um, so, and uh, you know, clients would be like, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> but I would be like, well, I'm a smart lawyer. <laughs> okay, so jurisdiction. I, I think that's an important point, but uh, you know, Disclose to the client, let them make the decision, and move on. Um, let's see. Let's talk about the right to display. Both, um, and it was mentioned that both Logo Tournament would have the right to display afterwards and the designer. So they, they sell me the Nike swoosh or the Adidas, uh, I don't even know what that is, a flower? What is Adidas? Yeah, I know what it is, but I, I recognize it. I don't know, but Adidas, Adidas logo. Yeah, the Adidas logo. Um, huh? Adidas Phoenix. Yeah. Um, so, I will. Who's ever seen a commercial contract of any type that was with a service provider and a client or a customer, where the service provider has put a clause in the contract that says? You hereby say that I can use your name and your logo on my website to say you're my client. It happens a lot. In fact, I think, so I mentioned I'm with a law firm. When I wasn't with a law firm, I had my own engagement letter. Now I've joined a law firm. They have a form of engagement letter that I must use by firm policy with any client that I bring in. In that engagement letter, it says, we have the right to use your name and logo and, and say that you're a client of ours. I don't really agree with that. I think it's overreaching by the lawyers, but whatever. So we have a good prior. You what? Approval. You what? Good prior approval. It was I will, so. Yeah. Well, but so I mean, to me, yeah. I see that provision as well. So she said with prior approval. Well, to me, if it says with prior approval, you don't even need it in the contract because I can always go and get your approval. And so to me, it's kind of wasted space in the contract if you say, uh, you know, or. And, and along the yeah, well, same. Even if it says with prior approval, why put it in the letter even? Because I can always go and get your approval, even if the letter doesn't say I can. Um, another, and on that note, so we're getting into the mechanics of contracts in general today. Another thing on that front, with, with kind of like wasted space in a contract. Oftentimes, you'll see a contract that says. Uh, unless the parties agree otherwise, ABC will apply. And I think those words, unless the parties agree otherwise, are wasted space in the contract, right? Because you could put that before every sentence in a contract. Unless we agree otherwise, this. Unless we agree otherwise, that. You always have the right to agree otherwise. Um, so I think those words have no place in the contract. But. <coughs> All right. Um, so the right to display without permission. A lot of people try and take that right. Um, and a lot of people try and solve the problem by saying, well, okay, yeah, if, you know, approval on a case-by-case -case basis. But to me, you could just take that clause out. You can always come and ask, and you can always say no. Um, what about the right to change with or without notice? So I want you guys, to, in your minds, to go back to your online contracting course. What did you learn about that, you know, that... Uh, clause in a contract that says, in this case, it's a lot of websites say that, right? We can change with or without notice, we'll email you, we'll post it here, whatever. What do you think? I believe we did so with one case um, that was in the Ninth Circuit in the California, I guess. Yeah. That was that you cannot do that. I think the FTC said something. I, mean, I don't remember very well, but I do know that we did one case where they decided that you cannot do that. Okay. That you cannot change the terms and conditions without okay. notifying no. first. Fair enough. So, yeah. So the idea is that it should be a reasonable notification for the amendment of the agreement. So notification, not agreement. As long as I tell you, I can change the terms. Yeah. Right? That should be 
Okay. Your thoughts? It might be uh, consequence of uh, uh, vacation or uh, the, the right to change terms and agreements. So, but the, the, the court has uh, given an opinion about it and said you have the client or the, because it is a must, that it must be distributed uh, agreement, uh, the client has the right to leave. And there is, that was uh, what the court said about this. Yeah, this is a really interesting line of cases on, the, on these online terms and conditions, all of which say we can change at any time, sometimes with notice, sometimes without notice. Courts seem to be going in the direction that that can be enforceable if, in certain circumstances, like if you provide notice. I think that's the courts protecting big business because if you look at um, contract law, right? what is a contract? Offer, acceptance, and consideration. 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 Something of value. If I have the right to unilaterally change any term, how have I given you anything of value? Right? If it's if I you know, I'll sell you my house for a hundred thousand dollars, but I can change the terms at any time. And you enter into the contract. Now we have a binding contract, and I say, guess what? Now the price is five hundred thousand. And it's still a binding contract because you said I could change the terms at any time. How has my offer to sell you the house been of value? It's really a, it's really a, goes to the issue of consideration to me. But I think courts are going to be protective of big business and allow it. But on the other hand, if, if you're looking for consideration at any time, you you're not going to change any contract at all. At all. Because you are not going to have any bargain. But what if the circumstances dictate to you that you must change something? Unilaterally. Not unilaterally. I mean, both parties coming and agreeing from the chain. So I tell you I'm going to notify you, I notify you, and then you accept. But you have no consideration for that. Yeah, right. So it's a change to the prior contract, not, the, not a, a new contract. I agree. Well, yeah, it's a change. But, but if in the original contract, the, the clause says I can change, I mean, that is in the original contract. It, it gives me the right to change my consideration. Regardless of whether or not I do. So I think even more than just this issue of, uh, I think these clauses really, when you think about contract law, they, they, they would make every contract invalid. It's regardless of whether one party actually does change the contract. Because the original contract says they can. It takes away the consideration, in my mind. Uh, but, yeah. You, you, uh, we did do that, that you can change your terms, but at least you have to notify or send an email that if I read it or not, it's up to me. But yeah. from the company, it has to do its like its part to send the email. Yeah. And then it's up to me if I read it or not. I think that's what courts are saying. If if companies do that, that makes it, it enforceable. But I still think to my other example, it, so if I if I agree to sell you my house for $100,000, but I have the unilateral right to change, as long as I send you an email, does that make it any better? No. Now the price is $500,000, I'm telling you. But then back again, like you, you, you agreed upon that from the very beginning, so it's yeah. like right, going right. back and forth all the time. Yeah, the case was with the Bank of America, I guess, and with the rates of the interest. Yeah, the I'm not surprised. Yeah, and they didn't send the email, they just changed the terms. I have this argument with my bank all the time, right? I get a statement in the mail, $5 for something. What? Why $5? Well, we changed the terms. Now we charge $5. You didn't charge me $5 when I brought all my money to you. Anyway. They have this right. They have this right. Yeah. Yeah. She doesn't like banks I don't like banks either for yeah. many reasons. Yeah. There are deals with like this, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I will not agree with this uh, right and unfin unlimited right to change. Yeah, but Just I think. Change once. Right. Mila Mila Please read this to a story again with, uh, about lawyers and marketing people. Like people who want to do business and be their lawyers. So right. It's always that dispute among them, but the fact is that business keeps going. So yeah. That's the whole point. And you know, I, I tell clients, 
actually, on this point, I've stopped telling clients. So normally, a client wants me to draft the terms and conditions for their website. I draft it. I put in the thing that says we can change anytime, you know, what, and I ask the client, if you want to change, how are you going to do it? You're going to post it to the website, you're going to e email everybody, you're going to do anything at all? And I put in what they're going to do, and I don't even tell them anymore, like, eh, look, this might mean that you have a failure of consideration and the whole contract is invalid, right? because they just don't listen to that. And I don't think it's likely that a court would say it's invalid, even though I think, like from a legal scholar's perspective, that would be so. All right, let me look and see what else I have in here. Any other thoughts about the terms and conditions from Logo Tournament? I have a bunch of notes. I want to make sure there wasn't anything I thought I should mention. Oh, here's, you know, another point is it kind of also goes to the issue of jurisdiction and where this designer is. There's a representation in here that um, everybody's over 18, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what if they're not? What if, what if a minor comes to you and says, uh, you know, I want to sell you my car for a thousand dollars, and you say yes, and you ask them, are you eighteen? Can you legally contract? And they say, yes, I am eighteen. I can legally contract, and they're not. What if, what does that do to the enforceability of the contract? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, does nothing because it's still invalid. Right? What's that? Right, he's not 18, even though he said he was 18. Yeah. Um, so that would be another thing that I would want to uh, chase down on behalf of my client. I would say, look, or, you know, maybe you can go through this contest, but when you choose a design, we have to figure out who this designer is, where they live, how old they are, and whether they're mentally incapacitated or, you know, whatever. Let's make sure that whatever the contract says, at least it's a binding contract. The other thing is, in in, uh, in some places, the age of majority is not 18. In some places it's lower, some places it's higher. It's a it's a local law matter. In your jurisdictions, is it 18? Yes. Yeah. And probably, except for necessities, right? So if a, if a child wants to contract, in the United States, if a child, if a homeless child wants to contract to rent an apartment, that, that could be enforced. In, except in a civil law, in a Roman law, if except a female is married at 16 age, he has a capacity to, she has capacity to make a contract, valid contract. She's really considered an adult. She's, she's considered to do. Okay. So, so to yeah. Yeah. Just, so the people who are between uh, 16 and 18 can make money from their as soon as the family court is not uh, doing any damage to their health, to their uh, school uh, duties, etc. So I can, I guess, designing uh, can be uh, 16 years old too. So okay. They can work in sports and entertainment. They can work in sports and entertainment. That's what they can There's a law that yeah. says that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, that's wow. where they might contract. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, can I make a question? How I can be sure that uh, the designer is over 18 when we are online contracting? I don't see him. Well, I mean, you have the ability to email him, right? Yeah. So you could say, And he will bring Please. you an ID that he's over 18, but in fact he's not. Uh, yeah, you could say, uh, you know, send me a scan of your passport, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and maybe he's not. But and this is just to discharge my... Let's say nothing. He's not 18. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the. Yeah. I mean, you can only do as much. This is a line thing, then, so you don't. You can see. In any scenario, you can only do as much diligence as you can, right? So let's take a much more sophisticated transaction. So let's say we're doing a, a merger, a, you know, a hundred million dollar merger, and uh, I say you're buying my company, and I say, uh, well, I want evidence that you have the hundred million, right? And you send me some fake bank statements, and, and I rely on that. I mean, it, that's a sophisticated transaction, and there's a material thing. I need to know whether you have the money, and you've sent me some fraudulent documents. As the lawyer, I don't think I'd have liability for that. I, I think I would. I would say, look, I did the diligence. Yes. They sent the documents. I verified. You feel your, your I was reasonable. Check. Yeah. Oh, it's kind of investment. I should go there, take the plane, and check and see. We do the diligence, and we are going to do the litigation.
show, so more work. Right, I know. <laughs> more work. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <coughs> so you had said, I'm curious about this, you said in the sports and entertainment industry, yeah. there's actually a law that says minors can and, and the contracts are enforceable? 15 years and above. Yeah. Really? Yeah. One cup, they have one cup, but from 15 years. The board can so wait, let's back up. So, <laughs> does the law say in the sports and entertainment industries a contract with a minor is binding, or does it provide for a mechanism to go get court approval? Which is it? You have to go and get the court to say yes, it's a binding contract, or not? I cannot say for sure for the uh, entertainment, but I can say for other boards. If a uh, minor with 15 years and above can work, it has workability. Workability, but that's not necessarily contractability, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then you oh, consider oh, that the yes. And no way to make it enforceable? Yep. So this is interesting. I ask this question because in the United States, <coughs> there's a way to make any contract with a minor enforceable. Oftentimes what people do is to have the minor's parents sign. Mm -hmm. It has no legal effect in the United States. Um, but in some states in the United States, because contract law is a matter of state law, not federal law, uh, in some states, one can apply to a court to ratify the contract. Uh, and in, uh, in California, New York, California and New York, there's a summary provision because of the entertainment industry in those two states uh, where you go to court and uh, it's a, basically a motion proceeding, not a full lawsuit. You file the motion before the judge, you, go to the, before the, you appear before the judge, the lawyer's there, the minor's there, the minor's parents are there, the executives from the record company, let's say, are there, and everybody tells the judge, we're all here, Your Honor, we want to tell you this is a fair contract, here's what it is, we need for you to ratify it, and the judge, after hearing all that, typically says, yes, okay, and then there's a court order that says it's binding upon the minor. Why does it have to be binding upon the minor? Because if you're signing the next Britney Spears, and you want to own that intellectual property, you don't want to run the risk of her disaffirming the contract later on because she was a minor. But in every state, even in the United States, which is you know quite advanced uh, from a legal system perspective, every state other than uh, California and New York is either no way to do it, like in your country, you just if you enter into a contract with a minor, you're out of luck. You could be out of luck, or you have to in Illinois even you have to file a full probate lawsuit, like you would uh, when someone dies. You file a complaint and then it would be a proceeding that would go on for maybe even a year or two before you get to a trial before a judge. It's kind of a, a weird thing to even think about because nobody's fighting. Everybody agrees, yeah, we want this contract, but you have to go through this long process. Um, so what I've done, this another mechanics of contracting tip, as I've said that before, a minute ago, just having the parents sign uh, doesn't make the minor's obligation um, enforceable or valid, but if you have the parents enter into a separate contract with you that says, I, the parent, hereby represent and warrant to you that my child will not disaffirm, then if the child disaffirms, you have a separate contractual claim against the parents because they breached that representation to you. The adult did. So as long as the parent and the child are still in the same camp, you can effectively enforce the contract. In the entertainment industry, there's some risk with that though too, because sometimes the 15-year-old singer doesn't like the, you know, 40-year-old uh, parent. Um, so, but that's a way to get around having to go to court and get approval. But I used to, <coughs> I used to uh, represent some record labels and they would have me go like twice a year to court with eight or 10 different contracts with minors that they had signed to recording contracts. And it was funny, you know, a fun day in court because I would be there, there would be a vice president from the record company and then all these little 
some little starlets uh, with their parents and, you know, all, all dialed up for the occasion. But we just go one after another in front of the judge. Judge, this is so-and-so, it's a fair contract. Yes, it is. So that's another point about Lobo tournament here. We'd have to find out how old they are and figure out whether we can make the contract enforceable. about it. Um, so at the end of the day, um, the reason I came to know about Logo Tournament through uh, diligence, I was doing, it was a, probably a $250 million transaction. So there was this software company. Uh, I represented a very large software company, like Fortune 100 company in the United States that was acquiring a bunch of little companies. They decided to buy this one for $250 million, so we were doing the diligence on the transaction, and um, this company was like a, like a Silicon Valley story. By that I mean, it was started 20 or 30 years prior by one guy in his garage as like a you know, side business, and then over 20 years, he grew it to be worth a, qu a quarter billion dollars, and he was then selling it. Um, and 20 years prior, or what, not 20 years prior, but maybe 10 years prior, he had gone to Logo Tournament and gotten the logo for his software company. And my client felt that that logo was, a, there was a lot of goodwill attached to it, a lot of customers recognized it, so that was a large portion of the $250 million for which he was paying value. <coughs> um, and we, so we started to do the diligence on that logo. You know, we asked questions in the diligence process to the seller, where did you get the logo? And he said, I got it from Logo Tournament. So I went to Logo Tournament, I looked at all the terms and conditions. I came to many of the same conclusions you guys did. But now, so let's change the hypothetical a little bit. It's not a client who's coming to you saying, uh, I wanna know whether you think I should go and get a logo from this company. Now we're 10 years later, they already got it and it's worth a couple hundred million dollars. Uh, and your, your client is saying, should I pay a couple hundred million for this logo? I, want, I really want this company. What should I do? What do you do as a lawyer? If you like it, pay it, and then we're going to do it. And then we're going to what? We're going to think about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, every customer buys with emotions. Right. If you like it, buy it, then we're going to think it. Maybe nothing will get us. <laughs> Right, and in, in, in those situations, the clients, I always refer to the company that they're buying as the Ferrari in the driveway, right? They, they just see that Ferrari in the driveway, they want to go drive it, right? They don't care what the lawyers say. We uncover all this stuff in diligence, what, well, there's this problem, there's that problem. In fact, I'll tell you another story about that same deal where we uncovered something else in diligence that we help the client really avoid a problem. But anyway, yeah, the client just says, oh, well, I want to buy it. So as the lawyer, well, you know, you tell them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and then they make their own decision. All right, but what else might you do to help them mitigate their risk? Yeah. For sure, we will start, like you said, the due diligence about the logo, how, uh, what has done to the owner of the logo after he bought it from logo tournament. Has he registered it somewhere or to protect it somehow? Right. Well, they, and they did have a registration on the logo as a trademark, but not as a copyright. And the copyright issue is, at the inception, you know, what is the important issue? Like, okay, you're using this trademark, but you may not own the copyright that's embodied within it. So what I did was, in that deal, I said, all right, well, let's go find this designer from 10 years ago. And... Uh, you know, and you have to deal with it tactfully because you can't let the designer know that you really need him to sign another piece of paper. 
Um, so we found the designer and we said, yeah, we're you know, just cleaning up the corporate records of this company. We saw that you sold them a logo 10 years ago. You know, we'll pay you $500 to sign this piece of paper. And you know, an assignment today, aside from the logo tournament terms, that gave us all the rights we needed. So that, and that, does anybody do mergers and acquisitions? Yeah. So to me, in the, in, the, in the diligence process, you're finding all these little problems and then you find a way to fix them. Like, okay, we got this problem, let's fix it. Yeah, and then, so that's how we fixed that one. We closed that gap in title for a very important intellectual property for the company. And then, moving on, um, with logo turned up, but remind me to come back to the diligence story. Um, uh, when I had my own law firm, I needed a logo. I mentioned that yesterday. And I knew of Logo Tournament because of the diligence project I had done. So I said, oh, this you know, could be interesting. For a couple hundred bucks, I can go and you know, get all these designers competing. But what I did was I went through the whole process. And when I got down to the final three designers, I emailed each of them and I said, okay, I'm ready to ch I might be ready to choose your design. It's down to three. But it's important to me that you sign this piece of paper, you know, and I had prepared a, a, a conveyance of IP to me, to the designer. I won't select your design unless you agree, outside of Logo Tournament, sign this separate assignment to me. And of course they were willing to. You know, it's a very, uh, they never intended to not convey all the rights in the intellectual property. It's just that Logo Tournament didn't do it uh, adequately. So um, they said yes, and I uh, had them sign it, and I got my logo from Logo Tournament. In the, not worrying about all the problems with this contract because I fixed them for myself. <coughs> um, oh, and so the other diligence, yeah, yeah, the other diligence. So this this company, I said the guy had started it in his garage, and um, I don't know if any of you have clients like that where you know it started as a very small business, but then it become became much bigger and much more valuable. Um, and to me, those companies, if they're still owned by one person or two people or three people. The way I refer to them is they're like it's like a pizzeria. So if you own a pizzeria and at the end of the night there's four hundred dollars in cash in the cash register and you know you need to buy some shoes tomorrow, you just take money out of the cash register and go buy the shoes. Which you really shouldn't do from a corporate law perspective, right? You can't commingle <laughs> company funds and personal funds, but if it's your company, you take the forty bucks, you know, and we all know that clients do that. But the issue becomes when a company starts being worth two or three hundred million dollars and the owner still has that mentality, the forty dollars becomes four hundred thousand dollars for the Rolex watch or the Ferrari in the driveway. So this owner of this company we were doing the diligence on, he had treated his company in that manner, even with those kinds of dollar amounts. There were cars and watches and things that actually could be traced title into the company that he wanted personally. So we had to clean up all that diligence, like, okay, get the car title out of this company, you know, and, but there was a piece of land uh, in, owned by the company, and it was an empty lot in a vacation community on a lakefront in the state of Virginia in, in the United States. And with regards, and it was purchased for about $400,000 with company money, and, but it was a software company. So in the, in the diligence process, we asked the guy, like, why does this software company own a piece of vacation land in Virginia? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, wanted, I was going to build a vacation home there, but uh, I never got around to it, and uh, I don't really want that land anymore. Just you take it. You know, take it with the, the acquisition. And my client's first reaction was, well, I wouldn't even know what to do. I'm a Fortune 100 uh, software company. What am I going to do with a piece of land? It would cost me more money to sell it, you know. So they were confused at first, but then it, as, a, as a lawyer, it put my antenna up. I was like, why? It's got value. Why does he want us to keep this asset when he took all the other assets? So I did diligence on that piece of property, and it, it was this lake had formerly been uh, part of a tobacco plantation in the U.S. Old South. And... <laughs> It had been divided into probably three or four hundred lots around this lake, now a vacation lake. But the very lot that my guy, or the, this guy who owned the software company bought, was the location of the former slave cemetery and the, uh, and the blacksmith shop. So there were not only uh, 
slave bones in the ground, but also toxic metals. Wow. So he was just trying to, yeah. he, he must have found that out after he bought the lot, and he was just trying to put it on us. But after we found that out, he said, no, 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 no. You take that lot out before we close the transaction. And he did. So this is another example of the kinds of problems you've you never would think in a $300 million or $250 million software acquisition you'd find something about a slave cemetery, but there we did. Um, okay, um, let me look at where we're at. Oh, before we look at a contract, we're gonna have a couple other things to cover, um, but uh, yeah, let's take a break. It's a good time for a break. Uh, take 10.